Good afternoon, Tuscaloosa and the internet world. Welcome in, welcome in. This is the Joe Gaither Show right here on BamaCentral.com and ba the Bama, part of the Bama Central Broadcasting Network. I am Joe Gaither, your host, and we're going to have a lot of fun today. Welcome in. Hope you're having a wonderful Thursday. It's been a, a fun morning, a busy morning, and we're going to get right into it on the Joe Gaither Show. As always, you can follow me at Joe Gaither 6 on the Twitter machine and on Facebook, Instagram, anywhere that you have your social medias. Joe Gaither 6 is the place. You can follow our show or listen on playback on Spotify, Apple Music, or if you want to watch us right there on YouTube. You can always leave me a comment on the Facebook side of things. That's the best place for me to see them. But I also love and see them on YouTube and on Twitter as well. So if you want to join the show, those are your best avenues and ways to do that. It's going to be a great Thursday, and we are going to be joined by my friend Will Miller. Will Miller, you can follow him on the Twitter machine at RealWBMiller. Will, I'm having to do a little bit, a little bit of a shuffle around because I just took... I just took Alabama softball off my computer and I'm loading them up on my phone so that I can see kind of the demise, the demise of our ladies right now. At least, at least for today's matchup, the uh, the Alabama softball team going out to Oklahoma City and currently are uh, currently are down by six runs and they just scored to cut it. I think they just scored to cut the lead. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, they did. Oh, look, my headphones aren't plugged in. That might help me so I can hear you a little bit. They just, to, to cut the lead, so, okay, that extends the game. It was, all right, great. Maybe I should just, just turn this game off because in the moments where I flipped it off the computer and, and now onto the cell phone, Alabama has scored two runs to cut it from eight now to six. It's still in the top of the fifth inning. Oh, Alabama just uh, getting it getting it taken to them by the Tennessee Vols. All right, good morning or good afternoon, Will Miller. What's going on with you, man? How's your day? Well, Joe, it was going good, and then softball got down by eight runs to Tennessee. That wasn't great, so it seems like every other at-bat, you're here in the stadium over in OKC, blaring Rocky Top, um, and it comes through the TV. So that that has not been a picturesque experience up to this point, but you knew it was going to be a tough matchup going in, and uh, it, it certainly has looked that way, to say the least. But nothing's ever easy, and... You don't want to necessarily, quote unquote, give up on this game, but you've also got to realize there's another potential game to be played tomorrow and just to not let the fact that they've taken it to you early in this game impact whatever your future uh, games are on this trip to OKC. Exactly, and you can't let, it, uh, you can't let today's matchup really – you can't get beat twice. Mm -hmm. Alabama, if you lose today, if you lose today, you're, pro you're probably taking on – Likely Stanford, because Stanford is taking on Oklahoma. You're paired up against the loser of that matchup tomorrow, and you don't want to go two games an hour. I, I think that I, I think that uh, I, I feel like Alabama softball has massively overachieved uh, to get to this point. I think that the the, the 18, 18 regular season losses, you saw the the off season turnover on the roster, massive transfer portal exodus, and and and, and in. What's the opposite of Exodus? Uh, <laughs> uh, you, had, you, you had a lot of roster turnover. I just think that, you know, th does it stink to lose Tennessee today? And it looks like it's going to be a loss. Now the end of the fifth inning or the, the middle of the fifth inning, Alabama down 10-4. to four. So it's looking like it is going to be a loss. But just where this team is, I'm not very I'm – not, I'm not really upset, Will. I'm not really upset. Well, you, you felt like there were a lot of questions going into this year because you got to go back to last season, Joe, and remember that that was one of the most highly touted teams really in a long time. You had the recruiting class was supposed to be really good. And as you mentioned, they're all more or less gone now. <laughs> you had some great new additions this season that weren't proven commodities at the beginning of the year. So you get to mid-February and you see these names like Kenley Cahale and Kristen White on the roster that have turned out to be amazing players that you didn't know going into the year. But this team has impressed me. It's impressed a lot of people. They showed a lot of heart to win that Super Regional last this past weekend in Tuscaloosa against Northwestern. They had a lot of adversity in the in the regional round in Tuscaloosa against uh, Middle Tennessee of all teams, which that team had some ball players. I, and I know that they got on a lot of people's radar at, at that regional, and they were very good. But – this team has done a lot, Joe, and I think they've done a lot more than people thought they would. But like I said, even if today ends in a loss, which if the chalk holds, that's unfortunately what it's going to be. 
you aren't out yet. You aren't out of it. You're still in the fight to win that national title. You're you're still in the bracket, and you've got another game. And if you win that, potentially more games to play and and to continue really to prove people wrong and to kind of defy that narrative that some people had placed upon them at the beginning of this season. Well, that narrative, let's just address it. The narrative, Patrick Murphy's lost his touch. Patrick Murphy, we need to hire a hitting coach. Patrick Murphy, you got to go, you got to, you know, throw him in the dumpster and find somebody new because he's not, you know, recruiting at the same level that he used to, blah, 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 blah. I mean, look around. Look around. What is, what's the road that uh, that the Rhodes House is on right there with the uh, the rec center? Look, look right there. I mean, all that area was built by Patrick Murphy. Really? You want to say 20 years, uh, you want to, you know, 20, 30 years in the program, Team 27 for him this year, and you want to get rid of him? I'm sorry, he's back to his 14th College World Series. I know you only have one victory, but uh, people put on uh, people put on the football expectations of every sport. If you go to the playoffs, you need to win it. Uh, it's much different in softball. It's much. Di- I mean, you, look, you see that in MLB, the randomness in Major League Baseball. Like when when you, when you get into diamond sports, crazy things can happen. So I just think that a lot of the noise that you heard this season. Do we need to have a conversation about Patrick Murphy? Like it's such a overblown caveman take like okay yes we want to win every single game 100 percent. you look at oklahoma you're jealous of oklahoma you want to be banging people's doors off run ruling everybody what they go like 43 and 1 48 and 1 i know they're only one loss uh like of course you want to be that dominant and you want to be smacking the balls out of the park left and right all the way through the lineup one through nine and alabama really has not been that over the last couple of years but <laughs> what have we been over 10 years a consistent perennial power in college softball and you want to get rid of Patrick Murphy for losing in the regional round last season not going to his first supers in like 12 13 years I'm sorry I think it's a little ridiculous to even even insinuate that his seat's getting a little warm over there well I do want to address this before we get too far off subject go for it the fact that you're to your point about diamond sports unpredictability there is a very feasible alternate reality where Oklahoma gets bounced. If Clemson finishes the job last weekend, you're, we're having a very different conversation about how this this bracket in Oklahoma City, this this field, would appear a lot more wide open than it does with Oklahoma in it. We were this close. So it's not a foregone conclusion that any one team is going to win. It's not a foregone conclusion that if Alabama gets beat today, they're going to get beat tomorrow and ultimately get bounced from the tournament overall a lot can happen like you mentioned and as far as the Patrick Murphy talk you said it yourself the football standard gets applied to every sport and I think softball is one of the victims of this just because of how successful the program has been you could also say this about gymnastics another perennial contender and powerhouse that that people have lofty expectations for those aren't the only examples but that's that's something that's it is the football phenomenon that's that's at hand here and Alabama fans have been very fortunate that football has won as much as football has won and that's not being talked about enough people have hypothesized you always hear these conversations of how long Saban has left this that and the other with that but what's not resonating with a lot of people is that when that day comes you you might not see football winning everything and you expect everybody to win everything like football does. This is not normal to win like Alabama football has won. It's not normal to win like softball has won. So this is an exceptional standard that these teams have set. And and this is normal for these fans. And it's a, it's a good normal to have if you're an Alabama fan. Don't get me wrong. You enjoy the heck out of it. But that's not, that's not real life for 99.9% of teams at any level, college, professional, whichever. What and will, will you bring that up? Not real life. I think a lot of times, and I love the Alabama fans. I I, I love the fan base. I mean, they pay our paychecks, reading our material, AlabamaCentral.com, and and consuming all our our, our content. We love them, but. <laughs> So many times I I wonder about reality. I wonder about, do you realize how special it is here in Tuscaloosa, the level of winning? You know, even even what's going on with the football and basketball program over the last couple of years, uh, both being at such a high level, that's a rare thing. 
You look back at Florida in the, in the early 2000s, they had a little bit of a run. But most often, you don't get schools with multiple sports. You don't get a school with multiple different sports competing at the national level. Not just, oh, this team's good and they, you know, they draw a crowd. No, softball is in the, in the finals, basically. This is the equivalent of the... Oh my gosh, Kinley Cahalen just made an over-the-shoulder catch with bases loaded. Oh, wow, oh. saving a run. Huge catch. Kenley Cahalen, the 18-year-old. Wow, to end the fifth inning and save Alabama from uh, giving up any runs. Whoa, what a play. And you know what, Joe? What, what, about, what about that? I mean, I'm sure that people had doubts about her with all the transfers they did last year. and. Her coming in is basically an early reclassification, and the child. You know. She comes in as a child, and she's one of the best bats that you have. I mean, that's I, that, I'm being facetious. I'm trying to be a little silly there, but but uh, try skips her senior year of high school to come play in the SEC softball, and not only come play in SEC softball, play in shortstop, second base, kind of vice versa, and holding down a, a, bat, a, a spot in the lineup like she's. Come on, if you want to say Murph's lost his touch as far as recruiting, point at Kinley Cahalen. I know we're about to lose Montana Fouts, and she's been the face of this program for five years now, but Kinley Cahalen is ready right there to step up. I think when Montana graduates, she's going to get the baton as basically being uh, that leader, kind of like Kaylee McClenney was uh, just before Montana. I agree, Joe, and I think there's a lot of promise with her. I mean, for – somebody to come in like she did being so young and to be really any kind of above average is truly remarkable. I mean, I'm not a career athlete and I'm certainly not disciplined enough to play a diamond sport, but my senior year of high school, you know, I was watching fights every weekend and just going to school and vibing out. There was no high level athletic achievement to speak of, not the least of which would have been moving to Tuscaloosa early, jumping straight into what, what a bunch of question marks and what some would call a tumultuous situation 100%. in excelling. I mean, I'm not doing any of that. I Nobody I personally know is doing any of that. So it's truly impressive what she's been able to do and what, what kind of momentum she's been able to create for herself and, and for the squad. Well, that – and she becomes now a player that Murph can – or she's becoming or is becoming uh, – that Murph can recruit around. Hey, come play with Kelly Cahalen. The last couple of years, just, hey, come play with Montana Fouts. I think the Montana Fouts crew, Montana, Jenna Johnson, Ashley Pranging, and Ashley Shipman, all, uh, you know, vital, vital parts of this program. But when you see them move on, move on at, at, after the season, it's going to be really important that a new leadership group kind of steps into in, into their shoes. And I think Kelly Kil- Cahalen has to be pretty much the primary the prim- <laughs> the primary component of that. I I again agree with what you say because I think for some people they've already lined her up as the next face of the program. You're not just losing Montana Fouts this upcoming off season either. So that's another point to consider. I just think that Kenley's going to continue to get better on the field too. She's going to become a leader. That's that's only natural. You know, I'm I'm 20 and I've grown a lot since I was Kenley's age, and hopefully we'll grow a lot more in the future. You know, hopefully I, I haven't reached my personal and professional apex at the age of 20. But the point being, she's going to grow and she's going to get better on and off the field. So I can only imagine what what kind of numbers she's going to post and how phenomenal she's going to be when she gets to be a junior or a senior, even next year as a sophomore after she's had a year to acclimate to being in college, to being an athlete in college. She's gotten more used to that because I think a lot of it is learning on the fly when you're in that situation, whether you're a, a true first-year freshman that went the conventional route or whether you went Kimley's way. There's still a lot of getting used to when you're having your first year in college. And so now that she's over that hump, I think that she's going to get much better in a very short time. Well, you you hit on that, Will. She she early enrolled this spring. And Mm so that's great. We see a lot of we've seen a lot of football players do the same thing early enroll in the spring after your, you know, after your Christmas break, you finish up your high school. The difference, Will, and, and what's more impressive 
you get guys who are the early enrollees, all the all the freshmen who are in the 2023 class for football. They didn't have to jump right into game week. They didn't have to mm-hmm. jump right into fall camp, game week, games every Friday or every Saturday, excuse me, and you know, training table on Sunday, prep on Monday, hard practice on Tuesday. No, no. Our football freshmen and and you know it just works out better. It just works out for them calendar wise. They enroll in, they enroll as freshmen in, in, in January and they get just classes, just classes. Go to class and every every day come over to Mount Moore and hit the weight room. Classes, weight room, classes. So it's lighter. I mean, it's not it's not it's not nothing. It's it's a lot more than I ever did as as a college student. But still, the, the fact that they the, the football guys are early enrolled, they're 17 years old. They get a whole semester to kind of this is what college is like before but before they have to go play with, with that Alabama across their chest. Kelly Cahalen, she gets thrown right into it. This is what college is like, and you're on national TV, and everybody knows your name, and look, you're playing shortstop, and there's a lot of pressure on you because we need your bat. <laughs> that that's a great thing to bring up. I, I really couldn't even imagine. I first got to college and my first semester was horrible. Yeah, horrible. I, I'm you know, I'm trying to remember where the where the bus hub is. My, my <laughs> yes. first week of freshman year. I'm not you know, nobody's putting me on national TV in a in a spotlight because I'm part of one of the because I mean I am part of one of the preeminent programs in, in what I do in the country, but it's not a sport. So it's not going on national television. And and that adds a whole new dimension that I can't well imagine. And yeah, I'm getting better under pressure as college goes on, but I sure. can't imagine dealing with that as a 17 year old, mm-hmm. 17 years old. I, I can't even, I, I mean, I was 17 not too long ago, but that was the year COVID hit. So the back half of it kind of blurs together. But like I said, I certainly wasn't playing a sport at the highest level there is for a program that transforms my respective sport and is one of the powerhouses and blue bloods in, in what I'm doing that adds so much pressure from people that you don't even know, because there's thousands of Alabama softball fans that come each weekend. The players don't personally know a lot of them. And you got a lot of countless thousands of people on social media, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Instagram, whether it's, YouTube comments sections, which, you know, can can get pretty ugly at times. So you're you're dealing you're facing the music from all corners from people you don't even know. You you have that pressure to to perform at the highest level and you're you're still you are still just a kid. A lot of college students are just a kid. I, you know, I keep, keep saying the child, but like she is a child. She just turned eighteen like three weeks ago. Like three or four weeks ago, pretty recently, during the season. It's like when I was eighteen, I was making stupid, stupid choices, very dumb choices, and I wasn't on national television. I wasn't representing the University of Alabama in any sort of capacity. I'm just impressed and blown away by by, by what she has done this year. And really, I mean, I know that some of our chats, some of our talks uh, in big groups has been a little bit uh, questioning her fielding abilities. So she's made some fielding errors, but dude, that's what happens when you're 17, 18, playing on such a huge stage. I think she's shown throughout the year the physical ability to, hey, I can make any play. You go back to what she just did like 20, 15 minutes ago, running back over her head, kind of like making a basket catch out of the, uh, into the outfield. So, like, I, I think she's going to be uh, just incredible over the next couple of years. I just hope that Murph can continue to recruit around her. I, I, I'm ne- not going to be in the Fire Murph camp. I'm gonna, it's, the, the, the program will have to take a huge nosedive. For me to, to even get into that camp, so I'm a long way away from uh from getting to a to a hot seat for Murphy. Yeah, my previous spiel was all tying back to my original point of that anything that she does that's above average is is truly impressive and and remarkable. But to add to your second point, I think Murphy's near unfireable. Sure, yes. You, unless unless you get to a point where you go like three years in a row where you're going one and. 55 or whatever. You're not making a regional. You're not, you, you, you know? you're finishing ninth in the SEC three or four years in a row. I mean, you, you're not, uh, uh, you, we could go a couple years, Will, not go, not hosting a regional, but going to regional, and that's fine with me. Kentucky went up to Northwestern. If we end up one year where we're just like, oh, not a top 16 seed, but I, I think the program is, is just fine. You just have to remember what Murphy's built, like you mentioned earlier. I mean, we have the the you know the largest on-campus softball facility in Tuscaloosa. 
They used to play in Sokol Park, Will. Wow, I didn't know that. They used to play, when Murph started, they played their games at Sokol Park. Ins- insanity, college softball in a public city park because there wasn't there wasn't a place to play them. That's what Murph has built. It, it, it's so people want to talk about. Uh, you haven't won a national championship uh, since 2010, right? Since, uh, since twelve. Twelve. Okay, excuse me. Uh, so you haven't won it in ten years. Blah blah blah. You've lost your touch as Alabama just cranks a home a solo shot. Uh, so to break it ten to five. Uh, that's 13. Who is 13 as they're all hugging her? Uh, Marley Giles. Yeah, so, so yeah, 13. Marley Giles uh, cranks her solo shot to uh, make it 10 to 5 for Alabama. I just think, like, you got to. You can't be a Johnny come lately or a Jane come lately who. I've only been watching this program for five years. I'm pissed we haven't won a national championship. Like, look, we used to be playing in a dadgum park and sitting on bleachers watching this program. Uh, so, so I think they're absolutely okay. One, one more take on, on, on the program, and let's go to Jayla Torrance. Jayla started the game today, and she ends up, okay, b- back up to last week. Jayla comes in relief on Friday to really kind of bail out Montana Fouts and stop the bleeding. Then she comes in Saturday, starts Saturday and Sunday, and sets up Montana Beautifully. 11 innings pitched last week, last weekend, seven strikeouts, only gave up two earned runs across her three appearances. Now, today comes out and, and Tennessee jumps on her a little bit and she gives up a big home run. That happens. What do you expect? Uh, one, what, what have you seen from Jayla in her growth? And two, do you, uh, if, the, if the game holds, uh, holds its result, will we see Jayla taking the mound, taking the circle, starting tomorrow? Uh, to to talk on your last question first, I think 100% you see Montana Fouts in the circle tomorrow beyond any quantifiable doubt. Uh, but Jayla had stepped up in a way that I think with time is, is only going to grow in terms of just how much love the fans are going to have for what she did. Because you have to remember where things stood. Montana Fouts gets injured against Arkansas – and people write the season off. They're like, the season is over. Montana was the lifeline for this team. And and Jayla comes in, and she wasn't perfect by any means, but really made you believe that that was premature, that any conversations of the season being over were, were premature. I would almost go so far as to say with some of the ways that those bats struggled down the stretch of this postseason that she is the reason they are in Oklahoma City. And that may be a hot take. I don't think it is. I think she's no, she the reason, is. I think she's the reason they're in Oklahoma City. I 100% and agree. That brings me back to my main point of as time goes on, this performance that she's put on over these past two, three weeks – is going to be heralded even more by this fan base and this program. Tough outing today. It happens. Happens to the best of them. And you can't judge what she's done since stepping into basically that number one role just by one bad day against one of the the nation's elite teams that you knew coming in was also a powerhouse. Absolutely. So with with what you've seen uh, – from Jayla Torrance over the last couple of weeks, and really, I guess we're going to have a couple, hopefully, hopefully a few more outings uh, with this season. Has she done enough to give you confidence that when Montana is graduating, okay, Jayla Torrance, you can take the ball and be number one next year? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The pressure that we talked about pressure all this episode in some form or fashion, but the pressure that she dealt with taking the mantle as the ace pitcher with the face of your program the star of your program injured and you didn't know for a large stretch of time there if her career was over and you were still contending to get this spot in Oklahoma City, you have to have somebody. She came in and and got it done. She got the job done facing an incredible amount of pressure. And she has shown elite stuff before. She's thrown a no-hitter. She's she's done a lot of great things even before this. I think she's shown me more than enough to to suggest that that she is ready to be the successor to Montana Fouts as as the ace, with the full acknowledgement that there will never be another Montana. But also with the acknowledgement that that dang, Jayla took on a heck of a task and and she stepped right into it. 
and it, it really just wasn't no thing to her. Look at how she pitched against Northwestern last weekend. A really, really good Northwestern team that put a lot of, that put a lot on Alabama that really made it difficult to, to make it out of that super regional round. And and Jayla was the anchor. Jayla truly was the anchor and and she helped hold the the Alabama team together and and continue to give them a fighting chance to even get here. Hey everybody, happy June. Well, let's move a little bit to uh, let's move a little bit to football before we hit the baseball regional. Uh, as just one conversation and one topic I want to bring up to you. We saw we saw the set with the we saw some seven guys enroll over the weekend for for summer one. Summer one got going. You taking any summer one classes? I am not. I Good am, for I'm you. I'm all in on Bama Central this summer, Joe. There you go. There you go. No summer one for Will Miller, and that's okay. I I never took any summer class. I took one summer class at Shelton State. Uh, 2013 14 uh anyway so summer one gets started and everybody's now enrolled the new the the, the rest of the freshman 23s and the buckner amos and Jalen key the transfers uh enroll big question here is keon keely five star mm-hmm. out of out of florida looks like he's wearing number 31 mm-hmm. what do you like what the heck we're just gonna we're just gonna crown him already before he's even taking a snap here at Alabama. We're gonna give him we're gonna give him the king. We're gonna give him the Terminator's number before he even steps on the field. What, what do you think about uh, Keon Keeley stepping in and wearing number thirty one for the Crimson Tide? Well, let me tell you, Joe, I absolutely love it because this is one of the most highly touted recruits and in a while, which is saying something for Alabama, which has set the standard in recruiting and. Alabama football has changed recruiting in all sports in the Nick Saban era. So without getting into that conversation, which at this point has grown quite extensive, I I love it. There's a standard here, Joe. There absolutely is a standard here. Will Anderson was a living embodiment of that standard, and it's paid off for him. Drafted number three overall, reunites with – or I guess not reunites, but unites with D'Amico, formerly a great Alabama player back in his day. D'Amico's going to love him. Oh, absolutely. And that's that's his guy. You knew it going in. I was surprised they even took Stroud, if I'm being honest with you. But obviously, no no disrespect to Davis Mills, who's a guy that I like. I don't think he's a long-term <laughs> solution. But I digress. I think that there's a standard that Will Anderson helped set that Keon is now expected to come in and continue and maybe even elevate with the type of freakish talent that he is. So to give him that number, it's going to give him a lot of confidence. He's going to go out there with a 3-1 on his back and on his helmet and and really know that this is what I'm going to be to this fan base. I'm going to be that that disruptive presence, that freak athlete, that that superhuman. That's gonna that's gonna bring this defense to once again being one of the top in the nation and him to be one of the top players in the nation for three to four years before he perhaps goes into the NFL and gets drafted in the top five. That's well, the standard. Just well, being an elite player and having an elite player's number is is only gonna add to that. Well, Will, I mean, we, we, we all remember the comparisons between Will Anderson and oh Derek Thomas. He's the next Derek mm-hmm. Thomas. Okay. Mm-hmm. I didn't think that was fair, but he, he pretty much he, he did as best he could to, uh, to to live up to that. Are we doing the same thing with Keon Keeley? Unfair. Hey, he's the next Will Anderson. He's the next Will Anderson. Is that, un- is that an unfair thing to do to these kids? To me, that's the big question mark. But it goes back to the standard I was talking about. You're you know you're you're not at a group of five school here. You're at an SEC school with 18 titles that's regarded by many to be the best program in the sport. The the fact is, and I wouldn't call this an unfortunate fact just because of where these kids are, is that you are at a program that is going to have the highest expectations and play at the highest level. It comes with the territory. It just comes with the territory. 100%. One hundred percent. So we'll keep an eye on all the football as we continue to progress. Our next big step. Oh, uh, well, I'll ask you about this because of SEC spring meetings. I'll ask you about uh, the coach Saban backing off. Uh, he's backing off a little bit. His staunch: we need to go to nine games. We need to go to nine games. What, what's your takeaway from him? A little bit of change in his mind this week. I wonder if it kind of has to do with the controversy that surrounded the three permanent opponents that we remember from a few months back. It seems like a lifetime ago almost at this stage of the game. But 
based on the trends that you saw in that, that maybe if they're if if they upped it to uh, four permanent opponents, I doubt it would happen. But maybe you could see Alabama playing like a Texas or an Oklahoma every year. And you got to remember the three permanent opponents for anybody that maybe hasn't seen were going to be Auburn, Tennessee, and LSU, which was, a, in my opinion, this is a pretty objective statement: the toughest three that anybody would have. And some some years are going to be tougher than others with how those teams are. Naturally, the sport's very cyclical that way. But pretty tough slate. And you, you have to wonder if Coach Saban doesn't want the league office and the, the people with the power to make those decisions to put his team in a spot where they're having what would be a disproportionate amount of competition relative to other schools. And Coach talked about it in his statement, talking about how Alabama has done a good job scheduling Power 5 opponents over the next 5 to 7 to 10 years. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and honestly, as a fan, as a fan of college football, I want those games. I want to see, uh, you know, the home and home with Wisconsin, the home and home with Notre Dame, the home and home with Oklahoma. Well, I guess that's going to be off off the board. That's going to be a conference matchup now. Mm -hmm. But but I guess we got to have a home and home schedule with Arizona State as well and Boston College. There was a number of them. I'm I'm interested in those matchups much more than any. Oh, we got to fill the schedule. Get me Austin P. Get me San Jose Mm -hmm. State. Get me you know Cupcake University State Tech like. Oh, get rid of those games. Those are a waste of my Saturdays. And uh, instead, give me the Power 5 opponents. And, and, and Coach was on that. So I think, Will, we might see the eight-game schedule hold for probably four, five, six years. Mm-hmm. And then you'll probably see the, the, the SEC move into a nine-game schedule. Because I think Greg Sankey got everybody in the, in the room this week and realized, oh, you guys have all been scheduling out for ten years, eight years. You know, it's going to cost the universities and the conference a lot of money to unwrite some of those contracts. I think we'll try to see uh, the sides all meeting together. Uh, you know, I, I've looked into those contracts in the past, Joe, just because those are the type of random things I get up to. I'm sure that doesn't surprise you, but those come with pretty hefty buyouts, like you mentioned, in, in a lot of cases. My main beef with the cupcake games is the 11 a.m. kickoffs. You put a cupcake game at 3.30 and I'm there. Uh, it's it's football, you know, it's football. And as a college student myself, you know, I you only get a limited number of times to see a game as a student. But I, I think that cupcake games are valuable to the sport just because of the payouts that you deliver to these smaller athletic programs. I'm all for all these kids having the opportunities to play football and to elevate their game and to get a college education, obviously, is is at the top of that heap of priorities. So without getting too much into the cupcake games, I'm liking these non-conference games, and I agree with you that the trend is going in the right direction on Power 5 versus Power 5 non-conference games because we were in a spell in the mid-2010s, really, where beyond like the week one opening kickoff games, such as your Chick-fil-A kickoff, your Camper World kickoff down in Orlando, who knows who the title sponsor of that is now, but to where it was pretty much avoided beyond that in the schedule, and now you're, you're seeing a switch in that, which – Fans aren't having these conversations at the SEC spring meetings. You know, Greg Sankey is not having these conversations as as a fan. These coaches are not having conversations as fans. But as fans, those matchups are better for college football, and you're seeing more of them. I think it's a plus, and I agree with your point. I think that that, for now, is going to stave off the nine-game SEC schedule. But I think that after that, after you kind of get through the cycle of a few of those, the sentiment is going to shift back to the nine-game schedule. You're going to see this revisited, I think, time and again until it finally happens. Well, Will, you talk about, uh, you know, Coach Saban and, and all the coaches aren't evaluating this like fans. You're absolutely mm-hmm. right. But Coach is not a dummy. Coach looks around Bryant-Denny Stadium and sees, oh, my gosh, we're only at 60% full when we're hosting Austin P. And these fans are all half asleep, and they're all leaving in the third quarter. Whereas when you bring in a high-caliber opponent, he's like, oh, my gosh, these guys are crazy for Alabama. They, they see the difference. It's 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 night and day difference in, in Brian Denny Stadium, I, and I mean I don't I haven't been to a ton of other stadiums, but I imagine the trends hold hold firm when you're bringing in good opponents. The atmosphere, the energy, the money is a whole lot better. So coach is no dummy. I think he knows that Austin P is kind of a waste of our time. 
Uh, you, we, we've got UT, you, 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 no disrespect to UTC, but we got UTC this weekend. I'll throw up the power C for my cousin uh, who, who graduated for, for, from UTC. But, like, come on, that's not doing anything from for Alabama. And you, as you mentioned, it's going to be an 11 a.m. game. It'll be in November. It'll be the week before the Iron Bowl. No, but we're all going to be, you know, making Thanksgiving plans because the Iron Bowl is the next week. Well, it's it's kind of a necessary evil, you know. In in, in a perfect it, world, these it, FCS it? programs don't have to come and, and get fifty nine owed in a in a road stadium, sometimes pretty far away from wherever their home base is, you know, to get a check. Like I, you know how much even how much fighting we both watch, and you see guys just do it for a check, and it's it's usually just a miserable scene. And I, you know, the cupcake games aren't very high quality games. It is good for those kids to get in those stadiums like Alabama, Auburn, Florida, LSU, Tennessee, et cetera, because it's, it's a memorable experience. But I, I think that one of two things is going to happen, Joe. You're going to see sentiment is going to shift back to the nine-game schedule, or if this trend of scheduling more non-conference Power 5 games against other Power 5 teams kind of grows and accelerates, you might see some cupcake games getting phased out, but people will be happy – with that, and they might not push for a nine-game SEC schedule. To me, those are the two outcomes that you're going to see in, in the recent discourse. Well, we'll have to see. I, I, I'm sure you're in agreement, Will. No, nothing will be decided right now. Nothing will be decided this week. I know Greg Sankey uh, made a public comment that he's tired of circling the tarmac with this t- discussion. He's ready to land the plane. Uh, well, Greg Sankey, you probably want to call for a plane to f- refuel you through the air. I think we're going to be uh, still debating this for a long, long time. Will, you play fantasy football, Will. Uh, you ever have a debate in your group that's like, 10 different opinions in uh, your, your, your league and you can't get people agreeing. You're having the same sorts of things, but it's not fantasy football. It's real life and real big dollars. And it's not just 10 guys. It's now 16 uh, programs. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't even go front with you here, Joe. I've been watching football since pretty much 2011, 2012. And Texas and Oklahoma and the SEC kind of still feels like fantasy football. Like, it'll take a few weeks. It will. Of- these SEC games, like we are going to see the Red River rivalry next year as an SEC game. Crazy. That thought is crazy to me, Joe. So it got it has that feel to it a little bit here in this preliminary stage. Yeah, my my, my biggest point with that parallel though is my, me and my league we fight like cats and dogs, and we fight, we've been together for. 10 years now, 8, 9, 10 years, and it's been the same people, just like it is with the SEC, Like, but we don't agree on anything. We have to take everything to a vote, and everything gets debated, and everything's like, do you have Johnny's vote? Do you have Billy's vote? Like, It's going to be the same thing with the SEC, but it's not <laughs> It's not just a random, like, we're playing for 100 bucks. It ain't nothing. Like, these guys are real-life dollars and cents, big money fueling. I mean, Let's be honest. The Alabama football program fuels the economy in Tuscaloosa. So, like these these programs, these decisions have real life consequences. It's going to take, mm-hmm. I think, a lot longer to uh, to decide uh, or to get anybody to agree on anything. Well, one thing's for sure, Joe. At least a hundred dollars is involved in these conversations that are being had. <laughs> oh <Boston>. yes, <laughs> uh, at minimum, for sure, for sure. Hey everybody, happy uh, June. Yeah, this is huge money. Like, like everybody's talking about these media rights deals. I think the Pac-12 is going to have one coming up here soon, and that's a huge moment for the future of of that league. And who's going to come in as as new members? Because they're going to have to expand if they want to stay afloat. Uh, but that's that's going to be, I guess, a conversation for people far smarter than myself, of a higher pay grade than myself, to to iron out. Uh, I am. I, I am. I did not get accepted for the Mountain West Commissioner position. I, I did put in an application. I did send in my resume, but I, I ultimately I was not able to stake my claim as as one of the stakeholders in, in major college football for here for the upcoming next half decade or so. So, very unfortunate situation. But I think with my studies and everything, it worked out for the best. Well, we all know you're the future governor of the state of Alabama, so that's going to be right. a, a much uh, much higher goal for you. We look forward to voting for Will Miller in 2040, something around there, 2036. I'm, I'm planning to run in the 30s, Joe. There you go, 2036. There we go, Will Miller. All right. Hey, everybody. Happy June. One more topic before we get into we round out the day. It is uh, 
the precipice of the first regional in Tuscaloosa baseball regional since 2006. Tomorrow, the Crimson Tide will host Boston College, Nichols State, and Troy. Woo! Postseason baseball in Tuscaloosa. Now, Will, I will let the listeners know we will be joined tomorrow by Andy Phillips, former Alabama baseball and New York Yankee and prominent Tuscaloosa businessman. He's going to be joining us to talk about the regional matchup and talk about his career and talk about just all kinds of things. So we look forward to hearing from Andy Phillips tomorrow on the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central and a part of the Bama Central Broadcasting Network. Well, let's chat about it real quick. I just uh, left our friend Jason Jackson. I left Luke Coleman and Andrew Pickney for their media availability uh, right about 12 o'clock today. Great time chatting with those guys. They sounded excited. We wouldn't have thought postseason baseball would have been in Tuscaloosa a month or a month or two ago. Alabama baseball now 10 and four since uh, mm-hmm. since the dismissal of Brad Bohannon. And look, I mean, Boston College 16 and 14 in the ACC uh, had had probably one of their best years. Look, Troy's bringing in a pretty big outfielder. Shane Shane Lewis tied uh, third nationally with 27 home runs. Nickel State, you know, second fewest runs in the ter- NCAA tournament this year. Uh, what are we going to see? Can Alabama advance to the Super Regionals and take ourselves to Winston-Salem next weekend and take on Wake Forest? So I absolutely believe so, but it's not going to be easy. Troy... For starters, is the one I'm going to start with because that's the most that's just the most familiar opponent to this fan base because they've played twice this year already, and Alabama won both meetings. They played in Sewell Thomas Stadium, and they also played at Montgomery Riverwalk Stadium, which is a wonderful venue if you if you're ever in that area and you you find yourself needing to go out somewhere with your friends on a summer day, taking a biscuits game. Great park, great atmosphere, great experience, but. Troy's familiar. They're a flawed defensive team, but if they can get it steady on offense, who knows? It's postseason baseball. Who knows what will happen? They string together a few hits, and they put themselves in a position where it might not matter. I remember coming home from my junior year of high school, 2019, when the Braves were playing the Cardinals, and I couldn't even get my stuff put down before the Cardinals (laughs) had a 10-0 lead in the first inning. So who knows what will happen? Alabama's not playing Troy first, so they're playing Nichols State first. That's an opponent that – convention expects them to beat the the four seed in the regional and coming in from an auto bid i would assume from their conference tournament uh but can't they, won the South, they won uh the summit league right they won the summit league for the first time since 1996 is that the league okay thing? i i thought they were in the big south i was that's i was gonna guess but i guess i was wrong about that um but no, Campbell is in the Big South, right? Shoot, they're good. <laughs> Southland, I'm sorry, Southland Conference, Southland Conference. Okay, yeah, I knew it. I knew it had South in it. I, I had the right the right train of thought. It just it it just pulled into the wrong station. But they won the the Southland Conference for the first time since '96. So it's been huh, a minute since they have seen any sort of success. But much like Alabama, their confidence is sure. riding high, right? Playing yeah. good baseball, win your conference tournament, reach new heights for your team. That's exactly what this Alabama program has done. So, again, can't write anybody off. This Boston College team is is a team that, to me, is kind of kind of flies under the radar. Any two seed in the regional is a tough out. Just because they're not hosting doesn't mean they're not good. They're a Power 5 team playing in a Power 5 league, pretty much automatically putting them up there. And so, for me – that, that's going to be a a, um, a tougher out if that's who Alabama faces. They'll face Troy first, and these same intangibles I discussed with Troy are going to come into play. They're going to have to string some things together offensively because they can't count on their defense. It's a, it's a tough position to be in when you get to this point in the year, but they can't count on their defense. So they're going to have to string together some offense and and do it multiple times. You know, they can't just get three or four hits and um, and that be it. They're going to have to put together eight or nine hits throughout the game, a bunch of runs. Alabama has to do the same thing. Alabama's going to have to have a strong first third, middle third, back third. Alabama's got a better pitching staff. I think the pitching staff is going to help Alabama a lot more than it might help these other teams, and it's helped them already up to this point. You just mentioned talking to Luke Holman, who's the ace of this team, and in my opinion has been one of the breakout arms of college baseball all season. Alabama's not like any of the other teams in – in this regional in that regard, they've got starting pitchers that they got three starting pitchers that have the capability to go six, seven innings. 
and the offense the offense can score. They've scored double digits, you know, several times throughout this season. Those starting really, pitchers going deep has been, in my opinion, the key for the last couple of weeks. Really giving Jason Jackson flexibility to use the, the bullpen however he would really like to. I, mm. I think that's been so huge. It mattered in Hoover. Uh, I know that they they didn't finish that run how they wanted to, sure. but it mattered in Hoover when they had starters go five, five and two thirds, and six innings, and and it put them in a position to win those games. So it, it is it is very important, and it lends itself to to Jason's strengths because before Bohanna's dismissal, Jason Jackson was the pitching coach, so he already has a rapport with these players. He's developed these players. And now you and now they're they're putting that on display at a very high level. So Alabama can rely on those arms a lot more than the other teams in this regional, in my opinion. And that's going to be the difference. That's what's going to separate Alabama from the other teams in this Tuscaloosa regional. And and what I believe will give Alabama the best chance to pull through and go to Winston Salem, which if that's what Alabama is able to do, that's going to be a tall order. You got number Brutal. one. Number one, and those debates have been had all over the Twitter machine, Joe. What's been said has been said, but ultimately the task and the fundamentals remain the same. You gotta, you gotta win your games. It's do or die, and that that's true no matter who you're facing. Yeah, Jason Jackson defended the committee giving Alabama a 16 seed today. Uh, I mean, what's he gonna do? Get onto the committee? But he was, he, he didn't look like he was putting on a face or putting on a, a show, he was asked, oh, do you feel like y'all were under siege? And a lot of people thought 12, 13, 14, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, and then they got to 16, and he basically said, no, the committee just got a tough job. We're happy to be here, this, that, or the other. Like, people are obviously looking ahead to that Wake Forest series and like, oh, that's injustice for what Alabama has been doing this year. I don't know. I, I Obviously, I am not a college baseball expert, but I'll lean on, I'll, I'll re- defer to Jason Jackson saying the committee has a tough, tough job. With the SEC, the teams being so stacked throughout the league, you can't just make them one through ten. You know? mm-hmm. I do want to give some insight into that, Joe. I John Cohen had mentioned something like they didn't value those last few games as much as conventional wisdom thought they did. Okay. That's that's a partial explanation. So when when Alabama, for example, beats Auburn for the final win in Hoover, that win ultimately probably did make the difference between hosting versus not hosting. But the run they've been on, Jason Jackson took over the beginning of May, more or less, and they've been 10 and four, which propelled them. Projections had them around the 12, 13 spots. They were projected in the D1 baseball field and at the 14 spot before the SEC tournament even started. So I think that that backs up what John Cohen said, that they didn't put the premium weight. The premium weight went to the RPI. The premium weight didn't go on to those last 10, 12 games of the year like a lot of people thought it would. Hey, everybody. Happy June. All right, we'll close this down with, obviously, just a, a recap on the softball. The ladies did lose 10-5. to 5. So Alabama will be playing at 6 o'clock on Friday against the loser of Oklahoma and Stanford. That's going to make for a busy day for Bama Central with both Alabama baseball and softball playing at 6 o'clock tomorrow. We want to encourage you guys to follow BamaCentral.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Bama Central. And we've got reporters. We'll have reporters at each event tomorrow. Alabama softball, Miss Katie Windham and Edwin Stanton will be out at Oklahoma City to watch With my guy Matthew Gibson Matthew oh, I didn't know I thought Matthew was out there good 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 thank you for saying that I don't want to leave anybody out absolutely not Matthew out there doing great work as well uh, so so they're going to be out there tomorrow taking on the loser of Oklahoma and Stanford Will Miller and myself will be over at the Joe with our guy Austin Hannon Austin's going to be putting up a nice little piece on Jason Jackson on BamaCentral.com today you'll be looking for that but we will be over at the Joe tomorrow let's close this bad boy hey, out everybody. Will June. Listen, Night of Champions. You and I both are combat sport fans, and part of that includes the soap opera that is WWE. Uh, we recognize it that it is kind of a soap opera, but Seth Rollins just to, just to, 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 to take this in three directions real quick. Seth Rollins winning the World Heavyweight Title. Cody Rhodes and, and Brock Lesnar, their little drama obviously going to set up a third matchup. And then the Usos taking out Roman Reigns. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm a huge Seth Rollins fan. 
Seth's my favorite and has been for years. So to finally see him win a world title again after his universal title run back in 2019 was probably justifiably panned by the masses is, is really vindicating. I think that WWE has, has really added for lack of a better word, art to his character that it distinctly lacked at that time. That's really going to push this next run over the top. Got to remember he's carrying the legacy of that title. That's beloved by so many fans. Uh, the bloodline has, has really been that soap opera aspect of WWE. <laughs> yes, it has. At the beginning of the year, they had their little incursion from Sami Zayn for the back half of last year. And he turned on Roman at the Royal Rumble. And ultimately that culminated in, Lifelong, basically lifelong, career long, best friends, uh, Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens dethroning the Usos at WrestleMania. And now the the straw that broke the camel's back has been Roman Reigns recent ire towards his cousins, the Usos, who are no longer the champions. So when Roman and Solo Sokoa, who is the Usos younger brother, challenged for the tag titles and Jimmy Uso finally attacked Roman, finally just said, I've had enough. I've had enough of this. The plan I'm hearing is to do that match, Roman and Solo versus the Usos at Money in the Bank in London on July 1st. I'm very excited for that card. Uh, international European card, Clash the Castle was great last year. Uh, and that was another, that was Solo's debut, actually, uh, when he saved Roman's backside against Drew McIntyre. So these full circle moments for the bloodline are, are finally drawing near. I'm, I'm interested to see where this goes. I think it'll culminate one way or another at SummerSlam. So, that's something worth in late August. That's something worth keeping an eye on. Finally, Cody and Brock. I really liked the decision to put Cody with Brock after he didn't win at WrestleMania against Roman. Won the Rumble, lost the title match. Okay, that you know I didn't get that decision, but to put him with Brock Lesnar was a high enough level feud that it didn't need a title and it still keeps Cody at the top of the picture. So I was very happy with that decision initially, and I've been very happy with how it's played out. I think that when the rubber match comes around, Cody's obviously going to win. They've been building him as more or less the top baby face in the company in my mind. Seth Rollins turned face, but I think a lot of people don't even know it yet because uh, WWE hasn't hasn't Seth done the best job of really Rollins. character that way. Um, but they're positioning Cody to be the top face in the company, and when he comes out on top of this feud with Lesnar that I think has already been very good, it's only going to elevate his credibility in the storylines going forward. Well, Will, that's going to do it for us today. I really appreciate you hanging out with me. You guys can make sure you follow Will Miller at Real WB Miller on the Twitter machine. Make sure you read all of his great work at BamaCentral.com, and we appreciate all of everything he's doing for BamaCentral.com. Will, I'm going to catch up with you tomorrow at the Joe. So uh, without further ado, man, thank you so much for hanging out with me. Thanks for having me, Joe. I'll see you tomorrow. Absolutely. That's going to be Will Miller on the program today. And we're going to wrap it up right here uh, and with big thanks to Chris Walsh. Chris Walsh, you can find him on the Twitter machine at Writing Walsh. And we appreciate him putting us on each and every day. We are a part of the Bama Central Broadcasting Network. We want to encourage you to listen to our other podcasts, All Things Bama and Blue Collar Unplugged. Blue Collar Unplugged with Matthew Gibson and Blake Byler. We're going to have Blake Byler join me next Thursday, the uh, one week from today. Today to talk about Alabama's basketball roster movement. Oh my gosh, Alabama is going after every single, every single player that's over six foot ten right now because we need some help in the post. We need some big time help in the post. But we're set in the we're set for the guard position. Oh, and just a little uh, sidebar. As I was at Sewell Thomas Stadium today, got me a little fist bump with Javon Quinterly walking past him. Just a little roll tide. Didn't want to bother him that much, but great to see him on campus. So we'll talk to Boyd Byler next Thursday. We're gonna talk to Andy Phillips tomorrow. Alabama baseball fame and New York Yankees fame. We'll talk to Christian Miller, former Alabama football player, on Tuesday of next week. So stay with us on the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central. We're going to be back one more day for the week tomorrow. We'll have the Friday program tomorrow at 1 o'clock. For everybody, I hope you'll have a wonderful day. Enjoy the weekend and roll time. Hey, everybody. Happy June. 